18 months that have absolutely flown by. Um, and it's wonderful to celebrate that moment with this, which is a learning moment. Um, and like we all like to say, is we're all perpetual learners. I know I am myself. It's the reason why I like to be a professor is because I love to learn. And that's what we're here. We always need to learn what else is out there, what's new and what's different, and what we can do to influence change. And in the different set of eyes that we bring to things, this is all about also what we do at the New School. And the New School is housed in the beautiful Fifth Avenue of New York and also here in Parsons, Paris. And the New School is made up of different schools, one of which is Parsons School of Design. So we bring design in everything. And that's what's been a fun thing too, is to see what design, the perception of design and what that is. And, and actually it's more than what may seem, what it may be seen. It's, it's actually taking a look at the design of everything, the design of business, the design of society, um, of how we take a look at a different lens and how we make a change for the better. Um, and so that's what today is about. So we're going to be talking about transform the world through strategic design. Uh, very aligned with actually what the New School is all about as well, is about transformation. It's actually, we're coming on our 100th year anniversary. And the New School started with that, with, with educators that came together and they were very different, a bit strange. And they were doing something unusual. And they wanted to make education different as well. And that's what we're doing here as well. This is what brings everybody here from different perspectives, but all with that intent to do something differently, to make a difference. So what we're gonna to do today is we're gonna go through a few different speakers. So we have um, the next hour and a half uh, for all of us here to just sit, learn, listen, think um, about what that might mean for you, um, to be able to hear what uh, these uh, graduates and, and very experienced professionals uh, have been thinking through, in addition to their professional career, uh, what they wanted to tackle in another subject uh, to be able to take a look at what transformation means and how we can do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to have very short interludes here, very short speeches, a, a type of TED Talk style, um, so that we can have that time to listen and learn. And then following that, uh, we're going to quickly sum up some messages along the way, and we're going to invite you. We're going to invite you upstairs, where there's a bit of a contrast of environment. So here, as you can see, we're in a very um, beautiful environment, but almost very futuristic. That's also very aligned with what we're talking about for the future. But what we're also going to do is we're going to invite you upstairs afterwards to be able to talk further, uh, to network. And we're going to be in, the, in a beautiful Parisian environment, and we hope to get inspiration from each other and from where we are. That's what we're looking forward to at the very end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first bring uh, our first speaker. Um, and, and it reminds me of something. So uh, one of the things, of course, as I mentioned, we're all coming from different backgrounds all together. But what's fun to do is to hear about what other people's job is. And also to kind of, it's like that, you know, wish and dream and kind of hear the coolness of what people do. And that's what I think about when I think of Sayang. Because Sayang lives in uh, South Korea and she works for one of the, and she works for the oldest newspaper, English speaking newspaper, and it's based in Seoul. And so that's what she does. She's a cultural journalist. And we hear about her stories and we hear about what she gets to do and where she gets to go. Um, and it makes us wish to go along with her. And in fact, I think we're all making our plans to, to go and visit her in Seoul as well. Um, so I'd like to bring her on stage and also do another welcome to everyone here. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being here today. Um, one small logistical thing, but this is an important one, and that is making sure that our mobiles are off. I know, I don't know about you, but I always check about 10 times before any event. Um, and then just to sit here and enjoy, and I'm going to welcome, if you'd help me welcome, Sai Young up to the stage. employees on earth because not everybody is. We have seen and heard of a lot of people who are unsatisfied at their workplaces. It may be because of their personality, their attitude, or sometimes it's the environment. 
But whatever the reason is, when, when you're unhappy at work, it can hinder your work, uh, life, work performance and also your overall happiness in life. Because two-thirds of our time is spent in the office. Imagine if you can go to work at 1 p.m. on Monday. You'll have a longer weekend to do whatever you want to do. Travel, uh, relax at home, or spend time with your kids. Imagine if you can take one month off on a paid sabbatical vacation given to you as a token of gratitude for your contribution at work. Am I talking about hypothetical examples? No. These are actual cases that exist in companies that I have visited in Korea. So then, do having these policies, does it actually improve happiness at work? Yes and no. It can come from the outside in. When you change a policy or a system, it can change people's behavior. And that can be the start, but it shouldn't be the end of it. When you go deeper into um, the core issue of improving happiness, work culture actually plays a pretty, pretty big role. And you're probably wondering why I'm talking about this topic um, or why I care so much. During my career, I've encountered a lot of people who are unsatisfied at work. And I wondered why, because they worked at top companies that everybody wanted to get into. They had high salary, good benefits, and work-life balance. But when I asked them, are you happy? They answered, well, I enjoy my work, I like my job, but I don't think I'm happy. And I wondered why that was. And it seemed like there was a deeper reason behind this than what was seen on the surface. So before I go on to um, introduce you to a couple of examples of good work culture, um, let me just give you a brief introduc introduction about how it's like to work in Korea. Uh, as you may al already know, Korean companies are known for their heavy drinking culture which is driven by what's called hwesik, which is dinner and drinks after work. And a lot of people are pressured to join. And this culture is slowly dying out, which is a good change, but it's still, still there. We're also known for uh, notoriously long working hours, intense uh, workload, and hierarchical organizations. We're also known for a uh, culture, pali pali culture, which uh, means quick, quick. And uh, anyone who has worked with Koreans would have noticed that Koreans can get things done really fast, and they can do it also. Uh, they can also do it well. No wonder we have the fastest internet speed in the world. But as much as it's hard to change these notorious cultures within traditional organizations, there are innovators at work who are shaking up the status quo and starter, uh, startups are behind this change. I'm a journalist at an English newspaper in Korea, and the greatest thing about my job is that I can access places that other people usually don't get to go. I can observe, experience, and meet various interesting and fascinating things, places, and people, which I feel truly grateful for. And last year, I had the opportunity, I had the privilege of peeping into eight different companies in Korea to see um, how these so-called innovative companies worked inside their organizations. And by innovative, I mean having outstanding work culture that sets them apart from others and that propels them to grow. And the reason I did that was because I was curious to see how these innovative companies worked, so-called innovative companies, um, because my company's culture wasn't exactly exemplary in that sense. So last year, I embarked on this project to visit one company a month and meet with their CEO, talk to their employees, and spend time inside their offices to see how it really was to, uh, what, how it really was to work inside these organizations. So today, I'll be sharing two examples with you from my visit. The first is Ua Brothers, which is better known for this brand called Delivery Nation. It's a food delivery app uh, which is the largest in Korea, and it was the pioneer in this industry when it started back in 2011. They started small, but now they have over 500 employees, 
And it's one of the most popular companies, uh, startups, that young people want to join because they're known for their wacky culture. And by that, we, we, we mean that um, it's very hipster, laid back, and cool. But what really makes them cool is actually their mindset. The CEO believes that a good company is one that actually meets the expectations of its employees. So this company, they try to uh, incorporate em employees' opinions in every decision that they make. Their decisions are made entirely democratically. For instance, if they're choosing a new location for their headquarters, uh, they would gather everyone's opinion and actually put that into action. And that's how they uh, decided to decided on um, decided when they moved to a new headquarters recently. They also have a bucket list of the wishes of employees that's updated every year, and the company tries to make that come true. They're also known for a very collective culture, a collaborative culture, and they, uh, they emphasize togetherness. So people here, they're not hesitant about giving each other a helping hand. Um, they're very, uh, they, they like people who foster other people to grow. Um, they value people who can um, actually uh, add value to other people's uh, growth. And so they hire team players more than star players. And here, there's no monetary incentives. Um, they're always, uh, their incentives are more coming from their peers because they stress relationships. And what was also interesting about this company is that they had a unique culture where they come every uh, once a week. Uh, they come during the morning. For 10 minutes, they would clean the office together. And that's part of their collective culture that has, uh, that has been there for uh, since the beginning of this company. And the next one is called Poeing, which is a restaurant information platform. Um, this is a relatively smaller startup of 60 people, and it operates like one big family. It's, um, it's a mobile uh, application and also available online. But this company is interesting because all of their employees are very close. And they're so close together that they would come together on weekends to go camping or barbecuing or invite each other to their houses to cook for them. And they're so close that, so close that they would even talk about the failures openly during meetings. And failure here is not just OK, it's encouraged. So people, when they come into their meetings, um, they would talk about their failures and mistakes. And they would not reprimand each other, but they would learn from each other. And the CEO here, he encourages people to take initiatives in projects. They're also very f um, flexible, agile, and open to criticism. And one thing that I noticed in this company that was uh, very interesting was that they don't use uh, negative languages. Swearing is banned, and uh, saying things like, no, you can't do that, or discouraging other people is all not allowed. And it seems like this type of work culture that creates a positive, open, and constructive environment seems to have had an impact because they have zero turnover. So what have I learned from all of my uh, visits to these companies? I learned that, first of all, there was a great leader. Without a leader who had the open mindset to push forth innovation, it's hard to implement change. And with all, the, all of these companies, there was a leader who sets the right example. And secondly, there, was, uh, there were great people. With, even with a great leader, without the people who can support that leader, with, without like-minded people who, ha who can support the ideas and values of that leader, it was hard to, it's hard to implement change. In these companies, there were people who rode the boat together. And thirdly, these companies were very collaborative. They worked well as a team. They were very uh, collective and cooperative. They were not hesitant about giving each other helping hands. And so they had a very healthy collaborative culture. Fourth, they were full of love. And by this I mean they care for each other, they pay attention to each other, and they respect each other a lot. And the basis of that was trust. And finally, they took ownership for their work and for their results. And that might seem, sound obvious, but it's actually quite hard. And people here, um, they take responsibility. 
They were very passionate about their work. They were empowered. They took initiatives and they worked like owners. So all in all, it comes down to the importance of mindset. Um, from these examples and from my visits, I've learned that leaders with an open mindset who can push forth innovation can actually transform an organization to create an exponentially better experience. And these companies, they were pursuing the greater good, they tried to contribute to society, and they were very empathetic both internally and externally. And they were constantly changing, innovating, and iterating, which are the basic principles of design thinking. So to conclude, I would say innovation isn't a leap. It's those baby steps that you make toward progress. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sayang. It's amazing to think about um, why we want to transform. As Sayang said, it, it comes back to being happy where we are, being happy with what we can contribute. And one thing of looking at that is, is where we work, so our work culture, uh, and how we can make a difference. And, and looking at the examples that, that are the ones that we need. Um, and this is where we can then transform our thinking also to not only our work culture, but our environment overall. What opportunity do we have to look beyond the four walls we're in, whether it's home, work, and so forth? Where can we go to the environment? And that leads us to our next uh, presentation. So I'm going to bring Jennifer on. Um, but before I do, I'll just mention, so Jennifer works in DC. She works for an architectural firm. And one of the main things that she does is she's co-leading the China market. Um, and why that's relevant for us, especially for our group is that part of our studies in our 18 months is to go to Shanghai. Um, so Jennifer was, you know, great to share different things about China before we went. Um, but with any new, new environment, uh, it's all about the learning when you get there. Um, you can try to prepare yourself, but then there's something that happens where you're like, oh, I get it now. You have to see it. And that's a lot of the learning as well as we can talk about things that we read and things and so forth, but you have to experience. Just like Cy Young has experienced it by going into companies, uh, we also need to look more around us and, and to see uh, what impact we can have. And with that, I'd like to bring Jennifer on the stage. If we can give her a warm welcome. Um. I'm really excited to be here, and I'm glad that you all made it. So I'd like to start my session off with an exercise with the group. So although this could be a little bit uncomfortable, I'd like to ask all of you to take a moment and close your eyes. Just relax, sit in your seats, get comfortable. I want you to imagine a clear blue sky. Big white clouds, very similar to the weather we've been having here in Paris. You feel fresh cut grass and dew drops under your bare feet. You listen for the birds singing. You hear leaves rustling in the wind and the warm sun on your face. You're relaxed and you're happy and you're comfortable. And you have a smile on your face. And you're holding on to this moment. Then the room goes black. A buzzer sounds, you open your eyes, and your smile fades. This is a simulation box that was created for us to experience what was once called nature. Scientific data proves that our environment is on a severe decline. What do we do with that information? We've heard of climate change and global warming. There's toxins, pollutants, carbon dioxide that has formed a very thick layer around our atmosphere. And the sun, it's heat that's not absorbed by the earth, is released and should go through our atmosphere. And it can't because there's this thick layer of pollution. So what happens? It reverts back to earth. And that's global warming, this heat trap is global warming. So we know this, sounds bad. We see the trajectory. It's going in a very 
unpleasant direction. But what do we do about it? Sometimes I feel like seeing is believing. My job as a global strategist has taken me to China multiple times. And it is there where I first could smell, see, and even taste the pollution that's in our air. We all share the same air, whether you see these things or not. We share the same waterways, the same soil. We are all interconnected because we're on the same planet. When I was flying home from my first trip, which was in November 2016, I had a very heavy heart. I felt guilty leaving China because I was going home to a place that had seemingly clean and clear air and water. And I just felt this very heavy sense of guilt. But then my buzzer went off, like my, my conscience had a buzzer. And it was then that I decided that I was going to design against the future. So we can look at this a couple different ways. There is scientific data that proves trajectories if we continue on a path, which can alter based on the pace of different layers. So you can either adapt to that, accommodate it, or you can change it. So instead of adapting, I made a choice to design against what I believe our future is. So I, you know, having finished the program in strategic design, we have this toolkit now. It includes design thinking, futures scenario building, exponential thinking, and I started putting all those pieces together to figure out a plan of how I can change the future, how I can change to live in a place that I am happy in so that I don't have to go into a simulation box to enjoy what was here millions of years before I was here. So I assigned myself a design challenge. I told myself, how might I create an organization that would promote environmental stewardship? It sounded, okay, sounds pretty good. So I started putting the pieces together. I, I wrote down my assumptions um, about the environment, how people feel in it. I tested that. I did the journey maps. I talked to friends. I interviewed people. I talked to landowners, farm owners, um, conservationists, and started digging in. I did research on how I could maybe build an ecosystem, a public-private partnership around bringing people together. I knew I wanted to create a community because I don't know everything. I'm not a scientist. I also think that we're stronger in numbers, and it takes diverse minds to make such big changes. But then coming back to that idea, like what are the big changes? Because environmental stewardship is just broad, right? It could be another recycling program. It could be something on the consumer level, things that are already happening. So I took a step back, and I'm like, I want a bigger impact. I want a, I want a very specific value for my efforts. So what would that look like? So I went through this process of iteration and started to deduce what my exponential value is. What's the most value I can get out of my effort that is just hone in on one thing? So that brings me to my final iteration. I probably went through five. <laughs> a think tank. A think tank in nature for nature where I would bring together a group of environmental scientists, entrepreneurs, innovators, curious people that have unlearned society's assumptions on what can happen and can't happen, because that's not allowed in the think tank. Anything is possible. Bring this group together, and what's my role? So once I assemble this amazing group of, of talented, smart, curious people who want to, want to change the world. What's my role and what is their vision? So how might we create a think tank to extract carbon from our atmosphere? So that might sound a little crazy, as most like truly innovative ideas are. There are people who have started testing it on smaller scales. 
And that needs to continue. And so as a collective group, I would run workshops on all the design strategies that I learned to get to this point, to get to an exponential value to give back. So in doing so, we would have rigorous three-day workshops on a farm. Some would even be longer annual summits where this global community can come together, like Melissa was saying, not in the four walls, outside, in the environment that we want to help support and solve. I believe in doing that, you're immersing yourself in an experience so that you can gain more empathy and get closer to your subject to help support it. So right now I'm in the process of building board of directors, which has been quite fascinating because they, <laughs> um, because they offer a great deal of advice and an ability to think differently than I would, and that's a huge value. And I welcome anybody who's interested in this topic to reach out and, and share their ideas. So in closing, after sharing my story, I would just like to let all of you know that whenever your internal buzzer goes off, no matter what the topic is, know that you too can design your own future the way you want. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. It's uh, amazing to think about what we have the possibility to take a look at, the possibility to change, uh, to transform. And that's also what we talk about here with uh, the nth degree, which is the name of this series that we do in New York and, and, and now starting in Paris, is bringing together speakers uh, that can help to bring these questions to light. Uh, it's about creative minds creating change, which is what we all try to do. Um, and I'm going to now bring our next speaker in, uh, who is Allison. And Allison reminds me also of the great diversity of different roles coming in mind. So, you know, you can imagine when we have a design program, so it's called strategic design. Uh, it's amazing to see who gets enticed to come to it, who looks at it and goes, oh, I want to do that. Even lawyers. So, and that's what Allison is going to tell us all about. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to invite her onto stage. Good morning, everyone. Yes, you heard Melissa correctly. I am the attorney that applied to a master's program in business design. I wish I had a dollar for every time I was asked, why do you want to go to design school if you already graduated from law school? So I'm sure you're like everyone else. You're wondering, how did I get here? You're not supposed to see that yet. Hold on a second. Four years ago, I was working at a law firm, struggling as an attorney, and yet from the outside, everything appeared to be perfect. I was working at a global law firm, a firm that on top of that, was known in the industry to be innovative and at the cutting edge of service delivery. And yet, I didn't have a mentor to help me grow. And if I'm being honest, I was really struggling to find work that fulfilled me. But every year, our partnership retreat would roll around and I would be selected to create the PowerPoint slides for our internal meeting. And I loved the challenge of visualizing complex legal concepts and sharing the story of the partnership's success. That year, I was asked to create a deck highlighting the fact that 125 of our firm's partners had chosen to work with internal strategists. I brought that slide to share with you today. The partnership retreat came and went, and before I knew it, I had partners calling me asking why their name was dark blue instead of light blue. Others called and wanted to know why their last name appeared sooner rather than later. And then the head of labor and employment called me directly, and before I could say hello, she blurted out, do you know about design thinking? Horribly embarrassed, I paused and admitted that I did not, to which she said, I think that you do. Based on the slides that you created, you clearly understand human-centered design. 
I think you are a legal designer. So I guess you could say that is how I got here. One PowerPoint slide and the daring belief that I could be a designer. So let me introduce myself. My name is Allison Silver and I am a legal designer. And we're here today to talk about how we can transform the world through design. And so I want to share some time with you today and tell you all about a moment of truth that fundamentally changed my perspective and really impacted the way that I approach my responsibility as an attorney. You see, uh, when we bring design into the world of law, leaders gain the power to align people and strategies to solve the complex problems facing our world today. It doesn't take much effort to look around and recognize that oftentimes that simplicity is missing from our world. Whether we're talking about organizational behavior or protecting our planet, the law is everywhere. And after a few years consulting and working as an attorney, there was this truth that I just could not get out of my head. And that is that the law touches every part of society in every corner of the world. And sometimes it matters what country we're in or what state we're in when we're talking about the law. But more often than not, the, e the legal issues facing our world today are global. These issues highlight the fact that the rapidly evolving and complex global economy is demanding that the law be become more useful, more usable, and more engaging. So I know you're sitting there thinking, oh, she got all attorney on me, what does that mean? It means that the law has to be simple enough that we as individuals can internalize it in our daily choices and so that executives can implement it in our business strategies. Whether we're talking about data privacy issues on social networks like Facebook and Twitter, or the contract of marriage and the global fight for marriage equality, even our luckiest citizens today afforded the most freedoms are being failed by our legal systems. Now, I'm not here today to tell you that we can easily fix these problems. These issues are pervasive and sadly, they are growing in nature. But I do believe that those of us that are closest to the law, I'm talking about our legal practitioners and our government officials, we need to do better. And I believe that design is the key to that better future. So understanding that design gets us to a point where we can solve the complex problems facing our world today, I want to share with you three things that we need to do to make the law more useful, more usable, and more engaging. One, we need to empower and encourage legal practitioners and government officials to be designers. We need to teach them empathy and iteration and rapid prototyping because this will create a better sense of current issues and humanize the legal experience. Two, we need to encourage legal practitioners to be designers by giving them the tools and tactics needed for success. We need to take these tools and foster a culture of innovation and promote a freedom to fail so that legal practitioners can test solutions in real time rather than in a vacuum. And finally, three, we need to create a community of legal designers. We need to create that community by creating a space where legal practitioners can knowledge share and test issues together because amazing things can happen when design plays a key role in problem solving. So what does this look like in practice? Today, I consult with corporate law departments and I use design principles to promote collaboration and drive innovation. I've spent most of this last year working with the leading American hospital system, driving active use and adoption of technology solutions, which in turn frees up attorney time so that they spend less time on basic case management and more time on strategy and patient-focused initiatives. But what I'm really excited about are two projects that I'm currently working on that are going to bring design education and design tools to the millions of legal professionals around the world. First, as a law student, and again, as a practicing attorney, I have seen firsthand that my legal education did not provide me the tools that I needed to serve clients and our communities today. And that is why I have founded Revless Legal the first design studio focused solely on the legal industry and legal education. This year, Revless is going to be launching two offerings, 
the first with Parsons, we're going to be offering legal design workshops that will bring an overview of the design process to legal practitioners while fulfilling continuing legal education requirements. I'm really excited about this opportunity because not only are we going to be filling a large gap that exists in continuing legal ed, but we're going to begin to provide attorneys with the soft skills that will complement their legal acumen and empower them to practice at the top of their license. And second, we are in the process of developing the first legal design toolkit that is going to have a practical set of principles and techniques that legal practitioners can use in their everyday work, clearly outlining how they can use design in their work as lawyers within communities and corporations today. Now, I know I said there were only three things that we need to do, but there is a final fourth point that I want to leave you with today. And that is that change happens with increased effort over time. So the next time you all are confronted with a complex challenge, I hope that you remember that the law touches every part of society in every corner of the world. And while we cannot possibly solve these problems one workshop or one toolkit at a time, there is hope. Because when we bring design thinking into the world of law, it opens up a world of possibility. For that reason, I want to leave you all with a challenge today. Do not be afraid to talk about issues, to test out solutions, and to challenge the legal practitioners and government officials that you know to do better. And most importantly, always dare to believe that you too can be a designer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Allison. So a great example, too, of how we can be that person to, st to start the change, even in environments that may seem unseemingly that maybe it hasn't been charted before. And part of that is also that, that mindset of being an entrepreneur. So taking a look at what we can do differently, what we can start, what we can create. And when I think of all of our gems and I think of the, the entrepreneurs that are part of our group, um, I think of Noral. And I'm going to ask her to come on stage and, and, and tell us about uh, one particular topic. And that is something that's also very uh, near and dear to Parsons School of Design. And that is uh, fashion. In fact, uh, this entire week is a series of different events that are going on in Paris uh, to celebrate uh, our graduation. Uh, and a graduation from many different uh, groups, many different degrees, many different groups of students. And so with that, the week started off with uh, a huge event on fashion, uh, with a fashion show. And so with the idea of fashion, it is something that is um, embedded in, in what we take a look at, especially with design. But when we take a look at fashion, it's also not only about the end result, but also the result after the fact. So what our impact is. Uh, and that's something that is uh, great to hear about. And I know someone in particular who's very passionate about this subject. And I'm going to bring her on stage now. Growing up, whenever I would ask my mom, who is your fashion icon? She would always say, Sophia Loren or Marilyn Monroe, who were not necessarily selling fashion, but they were selling fantasies. They were movie stars. Whenever I asked my sister the same question, who is now in her late 30s, who is your fashion icon? She would always say Coco Chanel, who is the definition of a fashion icon and a very much live brand today. But I always felt very differently about the question whenever I thought about it. I always felt like my fashion icon is my mom, or my first grade teacher, or the girl who lived next door who always looked sophisticated and, and effortlessly beautiful. Or most recently, it's been my sister, it's another sister. I always saw them within the real context of their own lives. And then I realized something. I realized I define fashion differently. I define it by relevancy, transparency, and purpose. 
But this is not only true for me. This is true for my generation, the millennials. And this is exactly what social media has capitalized on. It capitalized on influence versus affluence, which is unfortunately why most of us can name the family members of the Kardashians, but not necessarily be able to name, you know, let's say the president of Lithuania, who is Dalia Grybuskid, by the way. And yes, I Googled it. We are a generation that is driven by a culture of purpose, demanding transparency and engagement every step of the way, whether that's been translated into the emergence of the organic food movement over the past few years, or by supporting political candidates like Bernie Sanders, who is the first political candidate to be crowdfunded. These are the forces that are shaping the fashion industry today. When I was applying, um, to grad schools two years ago, I was looking at programs across the US and Europe, and I was just browsing and seeing what my options were. And my options were pretty much either fashion design or fashion merchandising or fashion business. And while I fully recognize the need for expert fields and expertise, generally speaking, as an entrepreneur, I felt like I needed something more flexible, something that is going to provide me with the right tools to be able to explore and, and find my own answers and, and problem solve within a greater context. And especially with today's technology, actually, you know, technology has really blurred the lines between what separates industries and everything has become super interconnected. So I was lucky enough to stumble upon this program, Strategic Design and Management at Parsons, which is entirely based on design thinking. Now, what is design thinking? And why do I strongly believe that it is the answer to the fashion system's lingering problems? I don't know why this is moving super fast, but... <laughs> um, I believe so because I found the answers in design thinking. And, and, and here's my thought process. Design thinking is based on empathy, co-creation, um, testing, rapid prototyping. And it is the ideal process to not only reevaluate the fashion system's challenges, but also to um, be able to address them efficiently. The first and biggest challenge that is known uh, today for, for the biggest industry is, of course, its environmental impact. It is the second largest polluting industry in the world after oil and gas. And then we have the second challenge, which is its lack of human-centered design. And what I mean by that is how painful high heels are. I mean, those were definitely designed with no human body function in mind. Our, our feet are flat on the ground for a reason, yet here I am wearing them anyways. <laughs> and last but not least, the need for new business models. Whether that means restructuring the wheel entirely or looking closely at the supply chain and maybe eliminating the middleman, whatever it is. Now, I'd like to talk to you about two examples. Um, these uh, examples are fashion brands that have emerged over the past few years in the fashion industry and have been catalysts of change. They, and they have done it entirely by de depending on design thinking. The first one is Glossier. Glossier is a beauty brand that started off as a blog uh, back in 2010, a beauty blog. This is Emily Weiss, the founder of the blog and the brand. And three to four years in, around 2014, she decided to launch her own beauty products line. And what's really interesting about this um, specific business model is that it entirely depends on co-creation. Co-creating every single product with their consumers. How, how does that go? How's that like? So for example, if they wanted to um, come up with, a, with an acne beauty product, they would send out on the blog a question to their million plus plus readers, and they would ask them, what is your dream beauty product? 
and they would collect the feedback, narrow it down to three features, develop a prototype, send it out to their readers, test it, collect feedback, and so on and so forth until they got it right, until they developed the dream product. Today, Glossier has raised over $86 million in funding, and it's been a worldwide beauty brand hit um, used by celebrities and world-renowned makeup artists. The second um, example I'd like to share with you is Rent the Runway. Rent the Runway uh, started off back in 2009. It started off as just an e-commerce platform renting, renting luxury clothing items to consumers at 10% of their original retail price for eight days. Now what's brilliant about this business model, it's actually my favorite, is that it is the Spotify and Netflix of fashion. It has completely capitalized on the access economy. And what's even better is that it happens to be fully environmentally sustainable, and on top of that, it's faster than fast fashion. And according to ThreadUp, retail and rental fashion are going to actually dominate the market by 44% in 2020. That's two years from now. So to sum up, design thinking promotes uh, agility, collaboration, and openness. It bridges the gap between the creative competence and collective intelligence that exists in the fashion industry. It is also key to empowering the next generation to become their own fashion icons by actively engaging, problem solving, and innovating. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Norrell. So when taking a look at the research that we all do, and especially out of the program here, um, and we take a look at the things that inspire us, and that's something that you can see from, from Norrell's research, and you'll, you'll certainly see from uh, the next speaker I'm going to bring on, uh, who will also talk about what her research has demonstrated um, in taking a look at innovation and taking a look at transformation. And that's something that we encourage everyone to do, not only because of being in an educational program, but also to look around us to see what may be new and different that we can, we can learn from others. And it's amazing when that happens, because when we do, it actually brings up great ideas for ourselves. It's actually where these entrepreneurial ideas start to then um, take a look and, and, take, and take flight. Um, and that's actually what can happen when you start that research process. So what I'd like to do now is I'm going to bring um, up Anusha, who's going to tell us about transformation while in motion. The Tour de France, more than anything else, is a race. And speed is paramount to success. So much so that when these cycles need adjustments, specialists ride alongside the cyclists at up to 50 miles an hour and make their changes. Think about that for a second. We can't even text and drive, and they need to do complex problem solving at high velocity. So it is, with, so it is in the corporate world. Companies often need to fundamentally change their strategies and change course while still conducting day-to-day -day operations and appeasing their shareholders. Like the Tour de France, this is no easy task. It's so difficult, in fact, that McKinsey estimates that up to 70% of companies fail when they embark on transformations. This isn't that surprising. You're really trying to change so many aspects of your business all in parallel. So what does it take to not entirely fail? Um, in my work, both as a consultant engaging in a number of transformations and working internally, and by studying a number of uh, companies that have gone through enough transformations to really embed a, a culture of constant innovation, I think there are four areas you really need to get right. The first is your organization structure and governance. The second is the way you implement this transformation. 
The third is the reporting and metrics associated with this transformation. And finally, your culture and engagement. Now, each of these topics deserves its own dissertation, but for the sake of today and time, I'm just going to highlight a couple of key lessons from each of these areas. So let's start with the organization structure and governance. Very important and critical is to have top-down sponsorship. And by this, I mean the transformation has to be a top priority, if not the top priority, of both the CEO and chairman. Strong and visible sponsorship is important because change is hard and you're going to get face a lot of obstacles. And visible sponsorship will allow you to surmount these and give you the decision rights to do so. It's not enough to have sponsorship from the top. You also have to engage the middle. At SAP, when they embarked on their transformation to embed a culture of innovation, they started by deploying about 30 to 40 designers across the organization. These guys then worked with the frontline, people who were working on you know, day-to-day products, and it was working quite well. The frontline enjoyed it, and the top you know, was very bought in. But middle management felt excluded. They didn't really understand what was going on, and so they resisted. Um, and it wasn't until SAP worked with middle managers to A, clarify their role as facilitators, B, explain the value of design thinking, and finally share with them the metrics or give them key KPIs to track that they were able to get true buy-in and the company as a whole was able to achieve the results they wanted. Third, it isn't enough just to have your employees engaged, you also need the buy-in of your board. And by this, I don't mean simply getting them to approve your agenda, your transformation agenda. They really need to understand that when you're trying to embed a culture of innovation, even the ways they interact have to change. You need to create an environment for the board to be able to listen to both successes and failures. At SAP, in order to get this sort of buy-in, they didn't just present to the board the value of design thinking, they actually walked them through design thinking workshops so they could really share what that means. At Mass Mutual, they went from having annual strategy sessions to having um, biannual sessions, the first dedicated solely to sharing um, aspects about the competitive market and company position, and the, th the second focus solely on decision making, so that the idea of using innovation as a long-term um, long term growth prospect made sense. Second, let's talk a little bit about implementation. Um, and first, I want to talk about goal setting. We're all familiar with typical budget cycles. Uh, an executive will say, I want 100. The other person will respond and say, I'll give you 20. And you'll negotiate to something in the middle. But when you're trying to be innovative, when you're trying to transform, you need to think big. You really need to drive to 100. And that requires work. If GM wants to be Tesla or AOL wants to be Google, thinking big is what's, only going, it's what's going to get you there. Second, and very common across any sort of uh, successful transformation program, is to be patient. While this pace of transformation needs to be relentless, you need to realize that it's going to take many phases. At Deutsche Telekom, they started what they thought would be a five-year total transformation. They're currently on year seven, and it's still going. It took them three years to get buy-in with the broad organization to get everyone on board. And it was in year five that they were able to then distribute to every employee design thinking handbooks, and now everyone is involved in the process. At SAP, they are now in year 12 of, of their transformation and their third phase. Their first phase started, as I mentioned, by just deploying design thinkers throughout the organization to start spreading the, the philosophy. Then, once they got broad buy-in, they customized design thinking to the different departments, whether it be HR and sales, so everyone felt it very ap applicable to themselves. And finally, in this phase now, they're working with their clients and companies to co-innovate in creating centers, uh, co-innovating spaces, so that they are now spreading the gospel even further. The third area is metrics and reporting, because we live in a world that loves data. Um, and there are two types of metrics we need to focus on here, external and internal. Especially with public companies, we know Wall Street tends to reward your typical metrics. And when it comes to transformation, they're going to want to know how you're keeping to budget, how you are uh, working towards milestones. But as I just mentioned, innovation transformations can be a little fuzzy. They take time, and things can be hard to measure. So how do you, how do you adjust your metrics to appease, um, 
appease those who want to know how you're doing. So some companies have really started using sort of customer experience metrics and market share metrics to really show the effect of innovation on their companies. And other companies are using what they're calling the vitality index, where they really follow the revenue associated with products that are designed, products and services, designed through the design thinking process so they can share its value. Also important are your internal metrics. Are you actually being successful in your quest to embed design thinking in your organization? At Pepsi, they track that by following um, when designers are involved and how often are they involved in a process. At SAP, they track how cycles of innovation are, uh, how long they take, and they started first at 11 to 15 months, and now they're down to five months. Additionally, many companies, in order to again, spread the gospel of design thinking, also track both the successes and failures to ensure that we know that failure is always part of the process. Finally, culture and engagement. Transparency and communication is key. It's really important when embarking on these large-scale programs, especially in large organizations, to make sure that everyone feels involved. Otherwise, you run the risk that people feel individual pain and cannot see the aggregate gain. And especially in innovative innovation transformations where things can be a little fuzzy, you need to be very creative in the ways you do engage with your, um, with your employees. So some successful examples have been using several town halls during multiple times a year, uh, culture surveys to really understand how people feel about it, um, and celebrating both the successes and failures in a very open and um, discussive manner. Innovation requires change, and change is hard. So how do you actually change behaviors? Because that's what it's going to take to succeed. Um, time and time again, we've seen, it, as opposed to just lecturing people about the value of it, you really need to get them involved. So to the extent companies can actually make many people go through actual processes and not just a simulated training, it's a really good way to get buy-in. But also, sometimes, you just need to demand it. At Pepsi, Indra Nui gave her employees about three years to get on board, and otherwise she joked she'd be very happy to attend their retirement parties. So, in summary, transformations are inherently hard and come with many risks, and even paying attention to all of these areas and all different aspects, you still cannot guarantee success, but hopefully with careful attention, you can avoid skidding off the road. Thank you. Thank you, Anusha. So we have one more speaker for you, and then we're going to do a, a, a short summary uh, where we've kind of explored lots of different topics here in relation to transformation. And our next speaker actually reminds me, too, of how far people come just to even study with us. So we have uh, the opportunity to bring people from all over. So we've designed a program that's for busy professionals where wherever they may be living in the world. And of course, with every design, you need to test it a bit. And this is part of the test is, can anyone be anywhere in the world and come together? So I think of the fact that you know we're here and we've met in Paris every seven weeks for an intensive weekend as part of our studies. And, we, and you've already met Sai Young, who's come all the way from South Korea every time. And now you're gonna meet Marina, who's come from LA every time as well. So we really have tested it from far ends of different directions. Um, and that also is not only from where we're coming from a geographical perspective, but also how we're looking at the world a bit differently. And what's been fun about Marina is she's always been looking at service design. It's a passion of hers. Um, I love hearing her speak about it because it always makes me laugh. Um, but in taking a look at service design, it's also looking at lots of different aspects of service design from where we are, from what we experience as consumers, but also where we experience where we are and how we work, um, which is also taking a look at a different aspect, which is on work health. So with that, I'd like to invite Marina to join us on the stage. <laughs> This computer is both my biggest nemesis and my greatest professional ally. It brought me a world of opportunities and then almost took away my ability to work. Let me explain. When I was in my early 20s, I started a career that I loved so much I spent hours glued to my desk working like there's no tomorrow. 
Sometimes after a particularly long work day, my body would feel a little odd. My arms would be tingly, my neck would be stiff, my hand would be shaped like the claw. And I did what any enthusiastic young person would do. I ignored it and hoped it would go away. But it didn't go away, it got worse. And about a year later, I found myself sitting in a doctor's office being told that I had developed a severe musculoskeletal injury from working at a desk in a computer for too many hours at a time. At that point, it had become so severe that I could no longer turn a doorknob or hold a toothbrush or sit down for long periods of time. The doctor said I had waited too long to get treatment, and if I didn't address this immediately and permanently, I might be forced to retire and go on disability leave for the rest of my life. Now, my first reaction was, okay, can we please wrap this up? I'd really like to get back to work. And it didn't hit me until I was driving back to the office. It was one thing to take care of my health for the sake of staying alive, but it was quite another to take care of my health for the sake of being able to work throughout my life. Work for me was very important. It was my way of making an impact on the world. And more than that, it was my way of making my family proud. They had moved me from Armenia to the US so that I could have better career prospects, and here I was, having put myself in a position where working hard might actually lead me to not being able to work at all. It was a sobering thought, to say the least. Luckily, I had help from Janet, the friendly human resources lady. She taught me how to advocate for my health. She helped me get treatment through a special insurance. She purchased equipment for my desk so I could be more comfortable. And she taught me about this thing called ergonomics, which is the science of tailoring your work tools to your body. Now, computers as a work tool were not new at that time, but its effects on the human body were still relatively unknown. And this was the first time that I realized that as technology is rapidly evolving, we're not stopping to see how it would affect our human bodies now, in 10 years, in 20 years, and down the road. Luckily, I got treatment, and I was able to move on with my career. And several years after that, I became an entrepreneur. And I joined a bustling community of fellow entrepreneurs and freelancers. This job switch came with a lifestyle change. It was one of an even more increased passion for work. And it was one of freedom and global travel. I could work from anywhere. I could work from my living room. Uh, my team and I could work from coffee shops or uh, airports or at a dog park if I wanted to. And what was interesting was that as I engaged more with the entrepreneurial community, they were amused and fascinated by my obsession with ergonomics. I would have friends asking me questions like, where did you get that portable standing desk? Does it really work? And, you know, I've been getting this pain in my neck. What do you think I should do about it? And it was, I wasn't providing medical advice, but I was bridging the gap between resources and information and the people who wanted them. Because I knew that this group of individuals didn't really have a reason to learn about ergonomics unless they had experienced it firsthand like I did. So when I got to Parsons, we started talking a lot about the future of work. And I realized that this very same demographic that I was part of was slated to play an important role in the future of our workforce. One study showed that over 57 million Americans consider themselves to be freelancers. That's nearly 40% of the workforce. And that number is supposed to grow over time, and the global trends are acting accordingly as well. So I took a service design approach to exploring the intersection between ergonomics and this new demographic of workers that I'll, I'll call the alternative workforce. And this includes freelancers, entrepreneurs, people who start a second job, remote workers that may work for a company but work from home, basically anyone who has a desk job without a standard desk. And as I explored this demographic, I found some interesting insights. First, there is definitely an increased awareness about the impact of computers on our bodies. It is now several decades into having computers as a primary work tool, and now we've seen what happens after 10, 20, 30 years of working at a desk and a computer every day. 
But while I'm glad to see that this information is getting a lot more media attention, this, it's still not entirely tailored to alternate ways of working. It's still heavily focused towards working at a standard desk in a standard office. Second, I discovered that knowledge alone is not enough. We need to build habits and understand what it means to habitually take care of our bodies while we work. It's easy, it's difficult to uh, make a habit, but it's even more difficult to break a bad habit. Finally, I discovered that making habits is difficult alone. A lot of my research involved me being immersed in different work environments. So I asked fellow entrepreneurs and friends if I could go and co-work with them in their homes or in their preferred workspaces. And it wasn't until we started to hold each other accountable that we were able to truly make and maintain some of these important changes that we would need to take care of our bodies. So using all of those insights, I used the design process to come up with one possible solution, the sitting duck. The sitting duck is a chatbot that messages people and tells them about different ways of working. It provides customized information based on your own setup and your own job and your own work styles. More than that, the sitting duck is a tool for self-awareness to help us understand how we work and to allow us to adopt better habits. It uses techniques of behavioral science to provide information in a meaningful way. So for example, instead of being that annoying alarm clock that might beep and say it's time to stretch, it provides specific actions that you can take now based on where you are at the moment. So it's like the difference between reading about a new diet or being given recipes and ingredients so that implementing it can be a no-brainer. Oh, so speaking of which, it actually looks like I'm getting an alert. I should, I should probably respond to this. We can, we can stretch now, right? That's reasonable. All right, so we see a stretch there. Do you guys want to do this with me? We've been sitting for a while. Let's maybe do this stretch together. So there's a diagram there. Uh, let's stand up for this. I think this stretch works a lot better standing. And it looks like the way this works is you take your right arm and you put it behind your head, and then you use your left hand to push your arm back and get a nice stretch. You can turn and say hello to your neighbor. That was a good chance. And then switch arms and now have your left, left arm behind your head and push back with your right. Say hi to your other neighbor. Wonderful, thank you for doing that with me. You're welcome to sit down. Let me just confirm that I did this so it gets logged. Thanks, Duck. I'd like to propose a mind shift, considering all of this information. There's a lot of great conversations happening recently about this idea of work-life balance. But I think it's also time to start talking about work-health balance. Work-life balance allows you to build your work and your career around a life that you want. Work-health work health balance allows us to build our daily workflow and our daily habits around maintaining our health. You know, working hard and being healthy should not be mutually exclusive. Let's imagine a world together where we can all adopt a positive work-health balance so that we can continue to innovate and make impact for years to come. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much, Marina. And I think we all needed the stretch as well. Um, what I'm going to do too is we're now at the end. So we've, we've, we've heard from six different speakers. I'm going to ask to get a couple stools onto the stage in just a moment. And I'm going to ask Loa to join um, to let's sum up a few things and see what we've, we've grabbed from today. Um, and in a moment, what I'm going to do is I'm going to then ask if you would all like to join us upstairs to continue the conversation. So just give us one second. We're going to bring things on stage. And actually, I'll ask Loa to come on up with me. 
And I think there's a microphone that you can grab. And while we're doing that, maybe to think through, okay, so we've heard from six different speakers on, on different topics, but all related to uh, transforming the world around us through strategic design, and what um, questions that might come up in our own minds that we can then take the opportunity to learn from others along the way. Um, actually, we can just stand, I guess. We're, yeah, okay, great. All right, so Loet is one of our graduates as well. Loet, I don't know if you want to quickly introduce yourself. Okay, sure. So um, I'm Loet Calberghi. I um, I live in Dallas in the US. Um, I work for a Spanish bank in customer experience. Uh, I was really very excited to, to find, out, find out about this program uh, and I'm sure in a few minutes we'll talk perhaps a little bit more about our experiences as students doing this program. But for me, I'm really passionate about transforming uh, people's lives and using technology and design uh, to do that. Great, okay, so now let's start thinking about what we learned today and all the different speakers that we've had who have been your fellow classmates, and maybe even thinking about where your environment is in the bank, because I know that you're working globally, trying to make change happen in lots of different ways and, and lots of creative ways. So one of the opportunities that we had also with Loit um, and uh, BBVA and the team is that we all did a design challenge with them uh, and had a chance to go to Madrid uh, and be able to take a look at banks in a very different way, which I really appreciated. Um, so maybe is there anything that, that struck you as from these six presentations? You know, what's the, the message that you've taken from this uh, that, that maybe is something that we can summarize to what we can tell others as well? Okay, so for me, um, one thing that really came across in these presentations and one topic that often comes up uh, to me in my day-to-day -day working and professional life is a lot of people assume that design um, is, some, is basically something that's maybe a bit superficial, that's something to do more with the colors, the aesthetics of something. But actually, to me, design is all about solving a fundamental human need. Um, and to me, that's really what's really come across all these presentations, right? If we look at the future of work, if we look at the, the environment that we work in, if we look at the legal system that really does touch every aspect of all of our lives, these are not um, aesthetic, aesthetic-based topics. This is really solving challenges that we all face as human beings. So for me, that's really what struck out um, and really the big value that I got out of this program, which is really understanding the role that design can play um, across our lives as, as human beings. And especially thinking about some of the, the messages or some of the imagery. And I was thinking about um, Anusha's presentation with uh, the bike and transforming while in motion. And I think for big companies, this is especially the case. It feels like you're fixing the bike as you're going along, and, and you don't actually get a chance to stop. I don't know if this kind of resonated with what you have to deal with on a daily basis as well. Yeah, absolutely. And Anusha's presentation in particular link, uh, resonated with me very closely because I work in a very large organization. We operate across 11 countries. We have 150,000 employees, uh, 60 million customers. And the challenge that we face is, you know, hands up, who loves their bank, right? No one, right? That, that's a guarantee, and I know that, and I own that, right? Um, and no one wakes up in the morning thinking, you know, I can't wait to get a mortgage, I can't wait to get a credit card, I can't wait to get a loan. And that's a big challenge, right, for a bank, because what people really care about is, I can't wait to buy that car, I can't wait to get that house, I can't wait to send my kids to, to school, or, or, or you know, whatever, whatever is going on in your opinion life. And that's a huge mindset shift that we need to make as a banking industry. We need to be thinking about not how can I shift more product, how can I sell more mortgages, how can I sell more credit cards. We need to be thinking about, you know, perhaps similar to what uh, Alison was saying, banking is one of those industries that literally touches everybody's lives every single day. And financial stress is actually the number one cause of stress in every country and every uh, in, in you know, regardless of who you are. So actually changing that mindset is really important. But at the same time, we have shareholders, we have employees, we have financial targets, we have KPIs. So we need to find a way, like Anusha said, to sort of you know, fix the engine while still driving at 100 miles an hour. Um, and that's a huge challenge for big global organizations. Absolutely, I'm thinking also, I mean, I love the way that, uh, how you look at things with the bank. And I would love that other industries did the same instead of looking at things head on of, okay, how do we get people to buy more, to, to, to have more mortgages, but more about the experience of why is it that they want that? And that could be applied to any industry that we're in. 
Um, and that's something that also we can take from each of these presentations, each of these different, different set of eyes. So that's what actually this program, and you were mentioning about our experience with this and why we're all about transformation and why we came here today also to share this with you, is that we all came together with different set of eyes. We're all leaving, of course, with a different set of eyes as well, um, hopefully a more enlightened view. Um, I don't know about you, especially after going through all the different learning and then the site visits and things, um, I tend to think we look at life differently and we're looking at details differently. Yeah, and I think for, for me, a big part of this program is the diversity in the program. And I really think you know, diversity is something that I really focus on. You know, I've lived in multiple countries, worked in lots of different companies and industries. I've had my own startups, I've worked in large organizations. But to me, the real value of doing this program was the fact that there was you know, the, the 12 to 15 of us that really came from different countries, different industries, different departments, and really bringing different mindsets to the table and looking and being able to use design thinking to look at a particular problem, but to look at it from lots of different perspectives. And to me, that's the real value of doing a program like this. And I really hope that as we evolve as, as, as human beings, that we really do develop that empathy and that diversity, even more so than before. Thank you so much, Doug. My pleasure. So just the last few words, because we're about to have that time together that we can even have a continued conversation, which is what this is all about. Uh, we've come here today with uh, the idea of the nth degree. So the nth degree, as I mentioned, is, is an event. It's an ongoing series of presentations, a series of bringing together uh, thought leaders to have these conversations and to get that dialogue started. And this is the first time we've brought that to Paris. And to do so, we've brought our GEMS, our global executive uh, graduates together to talk about something that's near and dear to our heart, which is transforming for the future. And one thing that I get out of all of this and out of all of you is that we all have that within us as an individual to make a difference and not wait for life to change around us, but to actually be part of that change and to create that change ourselves. So with that, I'd like to invite you to, to join us upstairs. We'll, we'll, we'll start to make our way, but also uh, please come over and meet everyone here, uh, get to know them. Um, and, and equally so, we'd like to find out more about, uh, more about you. Uh, and thank you so much for your attention today, for being here, and for and hopefully great ideas that may emerge uh, coming from today. Thank you again. Thank you.